The Galactic Council was in for a reckoning. You can't destroy a human planet and get away scot-free. Now the rogue fleet of 50 ships under Admiral Krieger was bearing down on the world of Madrias A. Two billion called the world home. It was an industrial system by plantoid standards. It produced materials vital to the Council's war effort. There was enough justification to put the Admiral's morals aside. No mercy was shown to the 500 million on Harmony. No mercy would be shown here. Sensors lit up like a Christmas tree as thousands of fighters swarmed from the human ships. Weapons fully charged, the poor souls stuck on the system defense platforms didn't stand a chance. They scattered and scurried towards their flak cannons, shooting blindly into the void. One shot hit its target. The aliens cheered and celebrated their small victory before swiftly being blown away by a coil gun. It was a terrible sight. The planet of Madrias A was a lost cause. But this didn't stop the defense fleet from trying. They rushed into battle positions. Fifty ships strong, they formed a defensive line 100,000 miles from the planet. Within minutes, they were being swarmed by the angry hive of fighters and bombers, ripping away at any unshielded components of the bioship defenses. Point defense systems fully charged up. Thousands of rounds per minute of superheated nuclear waste dispersed the angry swarm. The fighters began to turn tail and run. Some ten overzealous commanders pushed their ships forward. The whirring metal and fibers generated enough power to push the hulking living ship forward. Chasing after their enemies intent on thinning the horde, sadly for them, their bravery didn't pay off. Human battleships quickly capitalized on their enemy's mistake. Gargantuan coil guns, rail guns, and missile batteries firing in unison, ripping eight of the ten rushing ships into heaps of twisted metal and burnt biomass. The surviving two ships tried to slow down and return to formation, but the very prey they were chasing once again began to swarm. The two ships were ripped apart by the human fighters in mere seconds. Strong and once defiant ships became a dead field of space debris in less than a minute. The defensive line opened up all weapons, trying to keep the horde at bay. Bolts of plasma and nuclear waste streaked through space and split open any fighters who dared get too close to maneuver away. Human ships returned the courtesy, darkening the void with their cold and ruthless kinetic weapons. Traveling at relativistic speeds, the alien ships had no choice other than maintaining massive distance from the weapons. Multiple shots hit their mark. Another five ships were crippled or entirely demolished by the impacts. The human fleet split into three groups, one attacking the council fleet head-on, keeping the most powerful frontal armament occupied. The other groups dispersed across all three directions, moving above, below, and to the sides of the main formation. The three groups coordinated fire, shooting from multiple directions at their helpless enemy. Even more ships were reduced to shriveling plant matter floating in space, as the onboard navigators couldn't avoid all the projectiles swarming their ships. Gunners onboard the council ships shot frantically, they managed to disable around ten human ships by the time they went down in a blur of white light as the relativistic impacts shattered their hulls. Only five alien ships remained. Four of them jumped into FTL, trying to warn the others and get help. The one remaining ship charged at the human fleet defiantly, overcharging its reactor in an attempt to bring them all down. The plan was quickly shot down as the humans also jumped into FTL, going to the other side of the planet. The brave souls of the alien vessel died in vain, surrounded by the dying husks of what used to be their comrades. Now the mad admiral turned his sights onto the planet below him, the fate of two billion souls hanging in the balance. He waited long and argued within his own mind about the correct course of action for multiple minutes before finally deliberating his solution to the fleet. Total bombardment, no survivors, no surrender. Instantly after the order, the anxious gunners lit up the sky, wishing for nothing more than revenge for the slaughter of Harmony. Civilians looked toward the sky of Madrias A. Above their heads they could see hundreds of thousands of brilliant white lights. Like a deer in the headlights, they stood there for precious few seconds. After collectively realizing the lights were getting closer, Panic gripped the planet. First came the nukes, 
Well over 2,000 were fired, wiping out every major city and town on the surface, instantly turning the beautiful green bio-cities into charred heaps of slag and glass. Well over a billion perished instantly. They were the lucky ones. The next barrage was a hail of 30 feet tungsten rods, ironically named Rods from God. But if anyone was responsible for these weapons, it surely wasn't God. Crashing down onto the surface at thousands of miles per second, they liquefied the planet's crust where they struck, sending plumes of ash and molten rock into the atmosphere. Tectonic plates and volcanoes all over the surface began to erupt, turning the once blue sky into a mess of black ash and flame. In just ten minutes, two billion were reduced to only a few hundred left cowering in bunkers. In fifteen, not a single soul would be left alive. The humans had now become the very monster they so despised, the deep desire for vengeance and destruction completely unlocked. Admiral Krieger was unhinged of his morality, his men blinded by bloodlust. The war had only begun but it was well on its way to destroying the humanity of those who would survive it. Q-Tan High Counselor Q-Tan scurried about her office nervously. She knew the war with the humans would be a necessary evil, but didn't expect so much evil to come of it. What they needed now was a way to stop the human advance. If it wasn't stopped soon, the fate of the entire galaxy was in question. In front of her were the most intelligent scientists of the entire council. Without them, the war would already be lost, but within their minds was the key to survival and triumph in the stars. Or at least, Qutan hoped. What do you have for me? Qutan snapped, her voice shaky and uncertain, her limbs trembling from extreme anxiety. Your lives are on the line. Everyone's lives are at stake. The scientists looked at each other with pleading eyes, obviously trying to shift the responsibility of talking to someone else. Finally, the scientist in the center stepped forward and composed himself. By far the oldest and most experienced scientist, he blinked once and then began to speak. We believe there is a way to stop their FTL. He paused and gathered his thoughts. Their FTL relies on space-time warping to take them to a destination. With enough power, we could warp space to prevent entry into a system. Elaborate, Q-Tan demanded. We will warp space so that it takes the human ships to the outside of the warped area. It will only be crossable by manual and careful navigation. The space would constantly and randomly warp to prevent any wormhole from being stable. In layman's terms, please. They try to come in. We plug the hole. They can't come into the bubble in FTL. What do you need to do this? Every available resource, ship, lots of energy, and a blank check. Get it done. The scientists hurried out of the room. They knew they couldn't protect every system in the council, but they could protect a ring around important star clusters. It wouldn't hold the humans forever, but maybe it could grant them some time. Long, dormant, decrepit shipyards began to come out of their dormant years, once again growing the vast fleets needed to fight a galactic war. Minds long stagnant in years of peace began to once again light up, thinking of ways to defeat the humans. With the destruction of Madrius came the mobilization of an empire. Humanity was going to get their fight. Trappist won. The trillions of masses in the system were in an uproar, riots, fights, destruction, all because of one man, Admiral Gustav Krieger. 30% saw him as a monster and traitor. 30% saw him as a hero fighting the fight. Too many were too afraid to fight. 40% couldn't decide. Pockets of space began to enter states of open rebellion, demanding the government forgive Krieger, demanding they join the battle alongside him. Entire city blocks devolved into open warfare as the two sides clashed, police forces picking sides and joining the fray. If Governor Schmidt didn't get things under control fast, there could be a civil war within humanity's second largest system, something humanity couldn't afford. The viewing screen in front of him flickered red before going blue once more. We can't just absolve him of all charges. He disobeyed direct orders to stand down, President Jill coughed. She still hadn't recovered from the broken ribs due to first contact. If you don't absolve him, my citizens will absolve this government of power. That or go on the offensive, we have the kapa. Don't start it. Congress has to approve it, not me. Only Admiral Westman can pardon him of his disobedience. 
Then what would you have me tell the people? We'll counterattack in fifty years. Good luck until then. They'd have my head within the hour. Congress will have your head sooner if we go against them. Once they approve WMDs, we will end it. Until then, maintain order to the best of your ability. This is outrageous. How could you... The screen flickered off. Damn it! Schmidt looked out the vast glass panes, gazing at the Trappist IV skyline. Lights zipped up and down the great space elevators of the Ecumenopolis. Cars dotted the streets. Drones dotted the sky. Spires scraped the uppermost regions of the troposphere, the highest spires requiring constant supplies of oxygen to keep inhabitants alive. All this beauty was marred by the occasional explosion that brightened street corners. Sounds of gunfire pierced the night. Fires marked where riots raged on. Dust choked the air where buildings used to be. If the aliens ever got to Trappist, it would be rubble before they ever fired a shot. Schmidt needed a miracle to hold it all together. Trappist 4 is a hellhole. Fifty billion humans are dead, yet people keep going about their daily lives as if nothing is wrong. Ever since the First Florian Infantry Corps has been deployed about two weeks now, every day I've seen another friend die. I thought it'd be easy. We are the mighty Galactic Council, hundreds of thousands of planets, quadrillions of beings. We had the clear, technologically superior force, each weapon being capable of laying ruin to the stars. Or so we thought. When we first arrived in the system, we immediately glassed and cracked every unshielded habitat in the outer regions, well over 15 billion humans dead instantly. The 1,774 ships in our fleet destroyed every human ship in the system. After all, this system's main military force was busy rampaging through our space. We thought it would be some easy revenge. Our ships charged weapons and fired at the main terrestrial bodies. Over two trillion humans live on the three different planets, over half of which lived on the fourth planet from the star. Our mighty cannons belched apocalypse into the void. Energy hurtled towards the planet. Certain death awaited them. And nothing. The shots dissipated harmlessly across a vast planetary shield that we thought impossible. For months, we sat in orbit, prodding the shield and researching it, trying to get through. Eventually, we found a way to get slow-moving transport ships through, and a ground invasion was planned. Over five billion of us suited up in our exosuits and loaded into the transporters. Five billion packed into two million five hundred thousand ships. Our descent was beautiful the clouds and skies turning a dim purple in the sunset, only for thunderous flak to shred apart our ships and ignite the very sky. Of the five billion who ventured through the shield, only two billion made it to the ground, deep in hostile territory. I am one of the unlucky ones who wasn't killed by a flak shell. For the past two weeks, I've lived through hell, and I don't know how much longer I have. Our first engagement was euphoric, we the infantry were dropping into a cruel and dead metal hellscape. Twisting spires and other monstrosities of the steel city were turned into churning piles of ash and metal sarcophaguses of their human inhabitants. Terrified civilians mounted no defense and were mowed down endlessly. The neon lights of the cityscape were darkened and charred by plasma fire. The stench of burnt flesh filled the air. Our hulking exosuits, two meters tall, marched through the streets, decimating all that lay in our wake. It was too easy. No resistance had yet been met. It stayed like that for a week, civilians being slaughtered in the millions as we marched unstoppably. Then, on the eighth rotation of the planet, things changed. The once helpless masses of millions now stood defiant in our path. We pushed on, thinking ourselves superior. Then the first shots rang out. Human coil guns wielded by fury-driven militia ripped through our lines. They charged at us with metal spikes affixed to their weapons, screaming blood-curdling noises of rage. One by one, my friends fell beside me, human weapons ripping through armor and flesh, leaving steaming piles of liquefied remains in their wake. The metal hulks of skyscrapers reduced to rubble, lit up with muzzle flashes from primitive slug throwers. Our doubts of their effectiveness shattered when our squad leader was turned into a chunky mist as a slug connected with his torso. Men, women, and children took up these guns and picked shots at us while we marched through their streets. 
the once dead and cold steel monstrosity they called a city, turning into a fortress of bodies and munitions. People stopped abandoning their homes, preferring to stay and watch us from balconies, sending shots towards us occasionally. That's when we started facing their infantry units. On the 50th rotation, we encountered air superiority fighters and bombers. They began strafing runs on our convoys and supply lines behind the front line, destroying communications and disorganizing our troops. They wore body armor, making them unkillable to shots anywhere except their head. Their guns were powerful enough to rip through 15 feet of Dura Wall and still kill any soldier seeking refuge behind it. They fired at us from well-prepared ambush spots. As the spires of the city got higher and higher, they began to rain fire down unto us from the rooftops. Makeshift vehicles began to assault us, and the once ragtag resistance turned into a formidable foe. Our offensive stalled as human tanks began to crush our lines and decimate our troops. Wave after wave of fresh troops began to seep through the shield, acting as the reinforcements we so desperately needed. Now I began to wonder more about the place I was in. It wasn't some military base, horrid factory of death, no. It was a home. Beneath the rubble and cracked concrete, underneath the flaming hulks of armored vehicles in the buildings now devoid of life, was the once thriving, beating heart of a peaceful people. They lived here and worked here, used the roads we fight on now to get from great spire to great spire. No different from a council home planet, it was a center of entertainment and life, reduced to charred, cracked, and collapsing rubble, all by our doing. I have asked myself the question, what peace are we trying to acquire? When confronted with this question, I told myself that it would all be worth it when peace came. Yet I couldn't answer. I began to see the faces of the people I slaughtered, be it filled with fear, rage, confusion, or some combination. I began to see myself, a living being capable of thought. How were they that different from us? Sure, they were animals, not made of plant fibers or strands of photosynthesizing material. Yet they were alive, living in cities that they created for the sole purpose of life thriving and surviving here. Now on the final push towards the shield generator, I gaze upon the scarlet sky. Lit by the fires of human civilization, the desolate wastelands we leave behind. I can see the lights in the distance of families going about their lives, people walking the streets. Here near the core, even while fighting raged in the streets below them, humans continue going to restaurants, theaters, homes. Uncaring of the horrors beneath them, occasionally they glance down, see the battles, and admire the view. We have reached a point of such extreme population density that we do not have enough ammo to cut down the masses of humans. I can see people driving past us, above us, the bustle of uninterrupted city life simply flowing around us. The lights of the city and the sounds of conversations screaming louder than any gunshot ever could. I have decided now that this means one thing and one thing only. We are invaders in a foreign land, on a planet of people who wish for peace and prosperity over war, and we are the ones bringing true evil to this galaxy. We are the ones filled with bloodlust and hatred, not the humans. It was lies, all of it, and now I can't kill another innocent soul. I can't go any further than this point. It is pointless to fight them. Note found next to the body of Captain Krell Onabura, who died from a single gunshot wound to the side of the head. His suicide was not the first, nor the last, self-inflicted casualty among the infantry. Jenkins, I need some cover fire! Covering. Jenkins began to fire his coil gun into empty space, his dislocated shoulder blaring with pain as each shot recoiled into it. He saw an alien round a street corner before being decimated by one of his Mach 3 tungsten slugs as it shredded through its chest. His battle buddy, Johnny Ramirez, ran with his head tucked low, running to the safety of a Duracrete pillar five feet to the right of Jenkins. Only 20 yards behind him, a mass of people and traffic went about their daily lives in the deep core of the city. Grenade out! Two more aliens rounded the corner, only to be blown apart by the searing hot shrapnel that turned their fibrous bodies into a burnt paste of biomatter. They could hear gunfire above them, on a catwalk over 500 stories above their current position, 
A businessman was raining lead onto some faraway invaders before heading back inside his home to eat a sandwich. In a space elevator waiting pad, a mob of humans was using their fists to beat to death a squad of aliens who were trying to infiltrate the area and destroy the tethering cables. Once in space, the people boarded a craft and sailed right past the blockade. There were simply too many ships to shoot down. In other sectors of the planet, situations were much the same. Nightclubs remained open, and the people remained dancing even as the building they were in was collapsing. War and death had become an average part of life on Trappist 4, and people stopped caring. Loudspeakers across the city blared music and inspirational speeches, leading billions to take up arms and slaughter the alien invaders before losing interest and heading back home. With every passing minute, the alien advance slowed. Now it was expected that one single inch of land could be taken for one million alien infantry. Yet the shield generator still lay hundreds of miles away. It would cost the aliens billions upon billions of troops to take just a small portion of this planet. Yet the population was mostly unscathed. Every once in a while, the aliens would come across humans fighting each other. Gunfire was being slung from faction to faction, and rubble already clogged the streets and choked the air. Once the aliens arrived in such a place, the humans stopped fighting and immediately neutralized the alien threat, then swiftly began fighting again. Trappist was the rock that the council was beating itself upon. And yet, this rock had barely even been scratched. The worst was yet to come. Once the Florian Guard pushed through this small band of the residential ecumene, they would meet a great industrial ring, a wall of factories churning out war materials at maximum efficiency. Tanks, drones, planes, guns, bombs, and worst of all, flamethrowers. Week three came and all hell that was once contained broke free. Human soldiers filled streets wielding flamethrowers. Entire legions of the Florian Guard were burnt alive, the smell of burning wood and cut grass filling the air. Burnt biomass littered the streets, only to soon be trampled by humans rushing to and fro their work. Tanks rolled through the streets, crushing hundreds under their treads, churning their bodies into fine green sludge. Their guns thundered throughout the night, and more and more ground was retaken. Once the human forces had pushed elements of the guard to breaking point, they sent planes to bomb the already abandoned parts of the planet, turning this invasion into a mass grave for all things that photosynthesize. A chemical called Agent Orange was sprayed indiscriminately across the charred remains of a bustling city. Lifeless husks of the alien invaders lay strewn throughout the rubble, only to be ground down to dust by thundering human boots. The remaining 50 billion of the Florian Guard race back to the extraction zones, but human air power is absolute. The ground forces of humanity march onwards, overrunning the Florian Guard with every step. Of the 5 billion initial troops, none survived. Of the 145 billion reinforcement troops, only three survived. Those three were able to survive because they stole a human fighter, flew it to the edge of space, and hailed their fleet. They were rescued by one troop transport that flew through the shield and swallowed up their fighter into its massive loading bay. All three soon after died from exposure to Agent Orange, their survival being covered up. The invasion was over, and Trappist IV kept living.